Safety 2. Has anyone heard the term Safety 2? Yeah, That's good. Excellent. Um, if not, uh, then you'll, you'll soon know about it. Um, safety 1 is what people, I guess, are used to. Safety as an investigation. You see an RCA, an inquiry, and what's it called, root cause analysis, trying to find out what is the one thing that could have been fixed to prevent something going wrong. And that's kind of been the, the way we've done safety in the past. We look to find what thing went wrong and make sure that doesn't happen again. Um, safety 2 is a different way of looking at the same thing. Um, as many, many of you would have seen this picture, um, this was from the US Navy during World War II, where they decided for the first time to systematically investigate the, um, the damage done to planes that returned from battle. And they mapped the bullet holes on planes <clears throat> when they landed and, and have found this distribution. Um, and in those days, and, and still today, the um, decision about where to place armour was kind of a difficult one, in that the more armour a plane had, the safer it was, but the, the less payload it could carry, the, the less range it could have. So there's always a, a payoff or a balance between the, the amount of armour you've got and the um, capability of the aircraft. So they only wanted to put armour where, where the bullet holes were. So that was their thought. They should reinforce that central fuselage area, wing tips, tail. Um, those are the bits that get shot. We should um, defend those. And Abraham Wald was a mathematician working in the... Uh, in the um, organisation, and, and he recognised something called survivorship bias. What he realised was actually the planes returning and landing were the ones who had damage to the non-important parts of the plane. And that, in fact, this should be telling us that we should put the armour over the fuel tanks in the middle of the wings, over the engines and over the cockpit. And that makes perfect sense, because those are the parts that are a lot more likely to end in death to the crew and damage to the, and destruction of the plane. So it's a great example of a change in thinking which dramatically altered the, the effect of, um, of a safety program back there in uh, World War II. I think the, the current gurus of safety too are these two individuals, Eric Hocknagel and Sidney Decker. Sidney Decker is actually a US pilot who's moved to Queensland. At one point when COVID's settled, we might definitely need to invite him. But both of them have led the way over the last decade, decade and a half, um, in terms of changing the, the narrative on safety. <clears throat> because I realised that safety one works to a certain degree and it has improved safety in many organisations. But in complex systems, particularly in you know, high level aviation, once you've removed most of the simple things, and particularly things like medicine, that there's been a plateauing of safety improvements. And that looking at things from a safety one perspective is unlikely to get any better for us in terms of preventing very unusual complex systems problems. And it's also recognised that in very human related industries like our own, which are too complicated for robots to do, you can't automate most of what we do, that humans hold the key to safety as well as to accidents. And so they have, that has to be thought of differently. Um, you've all heard of crew resource management, CRM, and we've talked a bit about human factors, non-technical skills. Um, there's been lots of talk about that, lots of training in it, lots of um, input from various places. And, you know, they have been very important in improving the way we do things. But it, it always recognises CRM comes from the perspective is that the human is the problem. The human makes the error. If we could remove the human, if we could train the human better, if they would work better together, then the problem would not occur. So much so that in human uh, health, in health safety, we, we talk about to err as human, which is got a, the, the iconic paper and report um, into the US on medical errors in 1999. And they basically said that about 30% of deaths in the US healthcare system were due to human error. Um, and it was kind of a wake up call. But since then, you know, it's arguable that the safety one approach hasn't really yielded the results that we would expect it. You would also see there that there's a whole, um, whole set of safety event rates and sort of trying to compare complex systems and ideal systems. And aviation is always this kind of perfect system or nuclear power plants and then Formula One teams and then health all the way down one end, a long way away from ideal. And the, the first, um, first big writers on safety were people like James Reason, who came up with the 
Swiss cheese model that you'll, you'll have seen before, um, where holes in the Swiss cheese need to line up to allow an error to go from the event all the way through to the end. Um, and he even went to the quite detailed um, effort of classifying human error into these really complicated things. Unsafe acts, is it an error or is it a violation? Is it skill-based error, perceptual error? Is it a decision error? Is it routine, exceptional? And then all these other com complex uh, categorizations. <clears throat> and they're really not proved to be very useful because it all depends on your perspective. And an error is only an error if you decide to stop looking for other causes and attribute the, the result of an accident to that one person. So error is interesting, but certainly safety one has been focused on human error and, and error in general. Um, but this, it's time for a rethink in many areas because really the approach has been in safety one find the, the problem and it's almost always a person at the end no matter what some person did the wrong thing or made a mistake or didn't see something didn't understand the situation if we can get rid of the human and um, replace it with robots and computers and automation we'll have no problems and that's worked well for aviation and has not worked at all really for, for medicine in fact has created its own problems in, in aviation it's caused its own problems though it's created issues where human and uh, and and computer interfaces are making mistakes uh, an example was the m most recent Boeing uh, Boeing issues where their um, aircraft were crashing constantly, and that was a human computer interface problem where they tried to automate the human out of it, and that had caused its own problems, and that led to some some big accidents. But it's clear that as we speak, we cannot replace uh, our registrar and paramedic cohort with robots. Um, it's just a not a not a done thing, and the overtime rates would be much better. All that sort of stuff. But it's just not going to be doable, and it's very unlikely. We're we're probably in the most safe world uh, for in terms of auto automation and AI because it is just so complicated the interaction between humans and systems um, and particularly in pre-hospital retrieval medicine so again you've seen reason Swiss ch ch cheese model the multiple layers represent potential or latent failure modes and in the end though there's always a person right on the end a person who gave the wrong dose of the drug who cut the wrong um, vessel who did the wrong thing and that's what the focus has always been on and then when we investigate things we do root cause analysis we review cases in M&M or even learning from excellence what we're doing is we're going back in time but we have this massive hindsight bias because we're standing at the end knowing the outcome and when we look back it seems obvious why did they why did they cut the left ureter not the right ureter why did they give the double dose of drugs it's obvious to us because we have hindsight bias. And it's very important when we do investigations to remember that the people at the time were doing what made sense to them. And that's the, the assumption we must always make, that people come to work to do a good job, and I'm sure that is a reasonable assumption, but that things are much more complicated as you move through the universe, not when you look back. Um, and that's often forgotten, uh, particularly when uh, organisations do reviews of accidents. And I see it all the time in root cause analyses. So, well... You should have recognised someone. How could no one recognise this person who got a broken arm? You know, at, at the first moment, that's why they didn't get the diagnosis, and that's that. That clinician needs to be trained better, and, and that's some um, an obvious reason for the injury. Um, in medicine, um, you may have heard of Hadiza Bawagaba. She was a doctor who was working in a, a UA, uh, an NHS hospital. She just returned from maternity leave, and she was. Confronted with a difficult case, it was a, a young child with, uh, with Down syndrome who had um, sepsis. She, the, the department was very short-staffed. There were supposed to be a consultant supervising her but was not really able to. There were multiple other patients being looked after. Um, and this, pa this patient had a bad outcome. And, uh, and medicine did as bad a job as really you can at managing this case. This person went all the way to having the medical uh, <laughs> registration removed and then went on to be prosecuted for manslaughter in a court um, in, the, in the UK. Their self-reflected learnings were um, brought into the court case. Uh, the consultant who was supposed to be supervising them put his hands up and said, well, I had nothing to do with it and was able to walk away. Um, and this doctor was prosecuted. She's since had that prosecution uh, reversed and is now back working, but only by the, the loud voices of very, very many people who realised that this was not a human error, this is a systems problem, a systems issue. And when you stop looking for the cause of things at the moment of the person's act, then you've stopped fixing systems and you're now persecuting, persecuting humans, and that's uh, what we want. 
Look, the other thing um, that people do is they compare you know, aviation and aviation safety <clears throat> with medicine. And there are definitely things that we can and have learned from, from aviation, things like checklists, uh, things like closed of communication, a whole host of emergency action cards and, and, and um, these sorts of tools. But the, the idea that aviation and critical care resuscitation are in any way similar is just mad. You know, in, uh, this plane has been designed from the ground up to fly and not to crash. It has multiple safety systems. In fact, nowadays, most planes take off and land without any significant input from the humans. They're flying designated routes that they've flown on many times before and can be pre-planned. They are, there's lots and layers of safety. There's even two people who have nothing else to do except to watch all of the equipment and make sure things are going the right way. People now, pilots now fall asleep during their, their missions because there is so little to do. And the, the question in aviation is what can we do to re-engage pilots uh, because there is so little uh, asked of them most of the time. But compare that with a, a typical resuscitation. We've got ad hoc crews, people have never worked together. We have a patient who's crashing and burning. We may not know what's wrong with them. And numbers are coming thick and fast and changing rapidly. It's a completely dynamic and different different situation. So, you know, the, the things that, that aviation can teach us, I think, are quite limited. Um, and there's this description of this sort of spectrum of complexity that goes from simple to anarchy, um, where sort of everyone understands what, what's required and then technology is there to, to assist. And most of medicine lives in the complex and anarchy position. There is no, no technology that can completely take over from our job. Um, and there's often not agreement on everyone's part about what needs to be done. There's no randomised control trial telling us how to do things. So we definitely exist in this complicated and anarchic uh, universe. And the more we study complexity, we realise that there are these sorts of things, emergent uh, phenomenon or emergent systems. And that's the concept that even within simple rules, that complexity uh, can occur that generates things that look like they must have been man-made. Um, so these are rocks that have been worn by the ocean and the winds to, into these lovely octagonal shapes. And that's simply an emergent phenomenon from very simple things, water waves. And so much so in medicine, there are emergent phenomena that occur in complicated systems. Um, and those are maybe where the errors are occurring or where the, the safety systems should be looking. So, in safety one, we were worried, we thought that accidents happen because people find ways to overcome design flaws and hindrances, they just do their own thing. They adjust their performance to match demands and conditions instead of just following the operating procedure. They interpret and apply procedures to match the situation, which is not what we told them to do. And they intervene, intervene when things look like they're going to go wrong. And that, that's exactly what happens when things go well. It's because exactly the same reasons. People find ways to overcome design flaws and hindrances. We pretty much could not do a day of our work without having to work around some system or complexity that hasn't been written to an operating procedure, a manual or a protocol. We also couldn't do, do anything well unless we adjusted our performance to match demands and conditions or to interpret and apply procedures on, on the day individually on a patient that we see. And certainly we're essential to intervene when things look like they're going to go wrong. So perhaps it's not the, the us, it's the, the, the situation that's important. Safety one used to look at things like this and say there's a function, which is also called workers imagine, and then a success, nothing went wrong. That's good, perfect. Then there's a malfunction, something went wrong, and so then there was a failure. Um, but what we now understand is that actually everyday work, things that we do, can often have success and failure without any distinguishing feature beyond the two. And that emergent systems or emergent phenomenon from our everyday work is where the, the money is. And that there's maybe no difference between success and failure from a work perspective. So if you had to take away uh, anything from this, this is the one slide to, to review. It's safety one has been there to look at defining safety is trying to make as few things go wrong as possible. Try and weed out all the things that go wrong. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with it. Safety one is important. It's also said that management are going to be reactive. They're going to respond when something goes wrong. They're going to respond to disasters, respond to errors, respond to malfunctions. Um, and they're going, to, they're going to see humans as a liability or a hazard, a risk to be managed. 
You're also going to say that all the accidents are caused by failures and malfunctions. That's how we're going to define them. And the purpose of an investigation is to find that cause, that root cause analysis. Find that one thing, stop that happening again, and everything will be fine. Um, and they say that accidents, um, the risk assessment is of these accidents. We need to work out what these failures are. But safety two looks at things quite differently. It looks at things about how many things can go right. Let's look at things that go right as well as things that go wrong. It's proactive and it's trying to anticipate developments and events. It's not just looking at that tiny subset of things with a bad outcome. It sees humans as absolutely necessary and completely important for the resilience of complex systems. Um, it allows systems flexibility. Um, we also look at things that happen the same way regardless of the outcome. And that's the purpose of an investigation is, usually, is to work out how things usually go right as a basis for making sure things that don't go wrong. Um, and to understand the conditions of performance variability, because that's the sort of key where we can have some, some uh, say, and that requires looking at good and bad. And the, um, it really is trying to say that these holes are not really the, the answer, that this is a simpl too simplistic a way of looking at things. I'll give you an example. So everyone knows the story of Sully. Um, he was in a commercial two-engine flight um, and flew into a uh, flock of geese, which took out both engines. He was at about 3,000 feet, so only a few minutes after takeoff, so quite low. Um, he had to make a really quick call about whether or not he was going to land back um, at, the right, at the airport or um, whether he was going to ditch the plane. Um, he, his co-pilot started doing the checklists for double engine failure, and there are, in fact, double engine failure checklists, but they're, they're quite long, and they kind of predicated on being much, much higher up in the sky. Um, and so, for example, one thing that, that Sully did was he released the Ram Air, um, Ram Air power unit, which is a basically a little pod that drops down and keeps the controls and the, um, and the uh, instruments working despite having no engines. Um, but in the checklist, that's actually like right down and probably would never have had time to even get to it. So he started acting out of uh, instinct based on his experience as a pilot. And he made a rapid decision that they weren't going to be able to land at the airport and that they were going to ditch. The most, this is the most difficult and complicated thing a pilot can do, which is to ditch in water with a full plane load of people and fuel. Um, but he made it, and the rest is history. He landed perfectly. Um, everyone managed to get off, and he was a hero. But what would have happened if Sully had crashed that plane, cartwheeled, and everyone had died? Would the investigation have gone quite so swimmingly? Or would it have said... You didn't follow the procedure. You should have landed back at the airport. You took a massive risk with everyone's lives. You did the wrong thing. It's his fault. There was a checklist. You should have used the checklist. Gone through the whole checklist. It would have solved the problem. I think it's really interesting to, to look at the perspective because we only consider things a problem or gone wrong when we know the outcome. Does that make sense? At the time, it could have gone either way and probably was a line ball all the way up to the second they landed and stopped. So safety one is focused on that little tiny things that go wrong. Um, and they're kind of easy to look at because you can pick them out when patients die, or have a bad outcome. They're kind of easy to identify. Things that are difficult to assess that go right, right in the middle, and then there's this sort of early completion, excellence, innovation, and the positive surprises. That's an area that hasn't really been studied much, particularly in medicine. And if you look at it from sort of how easy it is to do investigations, there's that easy to see stuff. But it is kind of often complicated etiology and it is often difficult to change because quite often they're black swan events, one million, um, and it's kind of hard to know how to stop them ever happening again. Um, there's this middle part that's kind of difficult to see because it's just so much of it and so much noise and, you know, it's the 10,000 cases a year. It's not the, the five or six um, big, big disasters. Those, the etiology of those and good and bad are often quite uncomplicated. There are things you can take from pretty much every case and they're easy to manage, easy to change. And then right up the top, there's a kind of easy to see, amazing saves, miracles, however you want to call them, where things go really well. Um, and they're, often we, we can study them. We don't necessarily find massive learning for everyone. They're difficult to make everyone get to that level, and sometimes it's a complete life. So here's the kind of idea of, of where safety one has been focused, on that tiny little subgroup at the bottom. And safety two is now focused on predominantly that middle section of everyday actions, everyday work risks as well as opportunities. And that's been very interesting to our service as a, as a system to try and get better. An example of kind of 
the challenges of rare events, black swan events, was the um, uh, this this um, platform accident. And they classically, you know, Deepwater Horizon famously has this sign up, 329 day, days without a reportable accident. So their safety one had been working very well, and the very next day the entire thing blows up. Um, an example of how difficult it is sometimes with those black swan events, if you're just looking at safety one. The other thing I'm interested in is the, the, the term workers are managed, as, as imagined and work as done, but there's also work as prescribed and work as disclosed. And from a management perspective, this is kind of what I think about and why I'm trying to be really involved in, in, um, in, in all of our governance activities, because there's what work is as, a man, as imagined is. That's what the people who write the clinical practice standards or the protocols think you guys are doing out there. We, understand, we think what you're experiencing, what you're seeing, how you deal with things. Then there's work as prescribed. That's what we write down in the clinical practice standards. That's what we think you should do. Um, and based on what we know and the evidence and synthesis and expert opinion. And this work is disclosed. It might be a little bit different in that you don't tell us everything you do. You tell us most of what you do, but maybe doing some other things when we're not looking. And that's certainly the case in many organisations. So there's a subtle creep, changes to the way people behave when management are there and when they're not. So that work is disclosed and work is imagined. You want to be as close as possible to get it in an open and just culture. And then finally, there's work has done. And if work has been being done is different from work as prescribed, um, then there's clearly a disconnect. And we need to bring those protocols, clinical practice standards, uh, algorithms back to alignment. And if ideally all of those could be kind of much closer, that would be better. And so much of my interest in, in governance is actually trying to make sure that those things mesh, that um, all of those types of work are actually much more similar than, uh, than they might be. An example of how we do that in this organisation is we, we have daily coffee and cases. So this is where people are asked to discuss cases the last 24 hours or further if they're interesting. And we are literally learning from each other on the 99% of cases, not the ones that necessarily go amazingly well, the ones that go really badly, but the middle ground, the everyday work, the average case, the, um, the things that uh, are standard work. And I think that is where goal is, is uh, achieved. There's so much little bit, little uh, one percent as we get out of those sorts of discussions. We each learn from each other. It means that individuals can learn from the entire spectrum of experience that the organisation gets. Because as a single person, I don't get to do, you know, 24 RSIs a, a year and 17 major car accidents and 14 mass, mass casualties. But if I'm ringing in a coffee and cases, teleconferencing and all being there, then I can get a lot more experience than I would otherwise get. And that's where we can investigate some of those things. No, we do safety one, we do M&Ms, we do blood transfusion audits, clinical governance, airway registries, but we also do learning from excellence and we have done for quite a while. And that's trying to look at the things that go well. Are there, is there goal to be gained from there? And I think it has been very positive for the culture of the organisation. Um, even if um, someone doesn't necessarily appear on it, it, it gives confidence to people that the organisation is not here to criti criticise performance manage them as its major, major system. It's there to improve. And so... If we're looking at the good as well as the bad, and if you see a case presented in M&M &M and in uh, Learning from Excellence, then that, that tells you that what we're interested in, the systems, uh, systems learning. But clinical governance is very time-consuming. Our typical M&M &M takes about 40 hours of human work to, to develop, and then multiply that by about six or eight different audits done monthly. We are exerting a large amount of time and effort, um, but I think it's very important. I'll leave you with um, some further reading if you're interested in the world of safety too. The two best, um, or so this is the best um, book, and then there is in fact an audio book read by Sidney Decker in his particularly gruff American accent, which is great. Um, and I think that's a great first intro. It's probably his, it's probably his seminal book in terms of for the average reader. Um, and there's some other options there, um, which will give you some ideas about what you might read. Um, and I will, when we publish this on the web, those will be 